Hi folks, Frank the Pest Geek here, host of the Pest Geek podcast and owner of Nature Pest, a holistic pest management firm that focuses on organic compliant uh, facilities, integrated pest management. I know that's a mouthful for residential and commercial environments. Basically, what do we do? We take the same principles that are done in hospitals, hotels, laboratories, uh, basically high level facilities. And we bring that to the home or business. This is what we specialize in. And what we're going to be discussing is holistic pest control. The five most important things that people need to understand in order to get this kind of service to be effective for them. And we're going to go ahead and get into that right now. Okay, so five steps to solving the most difficult pest control problems. And getting into this, what we're going to be discussing is this is not pest control. Chemical is not pest control. This, these pictures that I'm going to show you throughout this entire presentation are pictures that we actually got on site. We have not downloaded these pictures. We didn't buy them. These are our pictures. Understand that I'm going into 15 years already as of May 5th of this year of 2021. It's been 15 years since I've been in the pest control business and over 10,000 services that I've performed in that period of time. I've seen some stuff. This is an actual picture of phantom uh, being used for inside. Now, here's the problem with this. A technician gave this customer phantom and gave him a, a, a little bottle and he's supposed to apply this every three months. The problem with phantom is that phantom has a very strict label applying this product indoors, meaning this can only be used as a crack and crevice. It can only be used as a pin stream in between appliances. The customer was space bore spraying the entire house with this. Here's the problem. The worst part is he contaminated all the home. He was not controlling the problem and all the surfaces were contaminated inside the home with a product that you're not supposed to do that with. This is what happens when people who do not understand pest control labels, the number one reason most people contact or wait to contact a pest control company is because they think the products we have are stronger or more toxic than the stuff you can buy over the counter. This was not an over-the-counter product, a ready-to-use product. This is a professional-grade product that you have to mix and dilute at the right rate and apply it according to label directions. And yet, because people think our products are so much harmful, they don't call us, but yet they'll go and do something like this to their own home, not understanding that they're applying it at the same rate, probably even more, because he's probably thinking, well, you know, this isn't working. I need to make it stronger. And he's putting more chemical in there than needs to happen. So you get a product like this. You go to the store and you get a product like seven that says kills over a hundred uh, insect pests. And there's ants and ticks and bugs and plants. And you're saying this will control everything. And it doesn't. Why? Because notice what it says. It says it kills. It doesn't say that it will control an infestation. There is no way that you're going to control an infestation with an over-the-counter product applied incorrectly when you have no idea of the chemistry or the biology of the pest. You can use a shoe to kill a bug on contact. I mean, it will kill a bug. I saw my mother do it. I saw my mother kill a rodent with a broom. It kills on contact. However, killing and control are not the same thing. And chemical does not equal control. And this is where the biggest misconception is. They read a bottle like this and it makes for good marketing. It's ready to use. It kills over 100 pests. It has to control everything. And yet, people are spraying this all over their homes and still not getting control of their bugs. 
even with a professional insect gel bait given to a customer where they can buy it online on places like Do My Own, which we are an affiliate of, full disclosure, we will recommend certain products to our clients that we believe they can do themselves. But even with a gel bait like this, people say, I bought this online. It doesn't work. Well, it doesn't work because you didn't use it according to label directions. Listen, I have pest control professionals that having failure with this type of product. My own technicians, until they're well-trained, will not be affected because they will not understand how I have to instruct them based on 15 years of pest control experience of how I've learned exactly how to use these products. There's a difference between you performing 10, 12 services a year to your house, if you're lucky, and a professional like me that sees 10 to 12 houses a day. And in my lifetime, like I said, I've performed over 10,000 services to homes. There are things that I have learned that a professional learns, like insect biology, like how the chemistry works together with the biology. Books we have to read, courses we have to take, and the field experience. So chemical is not going to equal control unless you understand things. So what I want to discuss in this series is why are you failing? And to help homeowners, property managers, uh, building maintenance people, contractors, understand that a lot of things that you're doing and not doing are contributing to the problem that if you just fix these problems, yes, we are initially going to go in and use the chemical, but we have to have it so much less and you're going to have so many happy tenants and you're going to be a more happy homeowner by following these simple directions of things we have to do. So one of the first things is you got bad information. You read a pest control blog somewhere by written by somebody who's not a pest control professional who read that you can put bay leaves around windows and it will deter ants or something like that. Well, you need good information. Where does it come from? Your number one source to get really good information is from your local state university. Every state university has what is known as an entomology program. They are the ones that study the pests and the pest problems in your state and know specifically what pest problems you have in your state and can tell you and help you identify them and help you with the control. They have expert blogs, but you have to read them and you have to study the entomological material known as the biology of pests, how that pest behaves, what that pest eats. What does that pest drink? Where does it hide? Where does it come from? Where is the nesting sites? This is the information you need. And only we use in Florida, University of Florida IFAS program, which is a cooperative program between the county, the state, the, the university, and what is known as the extension service. And your best bet for identifying bugs is to send pictures to either a local professional like myself, or send it to the extension service. Even us as professionals sometimes can identify a certain bug that we've seen for the first time. And we have to go to either a laboratory or, or an entomologist and say, can you identify this for us and know exactly what it is? Sometimes I will spend three to four hours behind a microscope studying all the body parts counting how many nodes are in the antenna, how many hairs are on the body, where those hairs are, what the gaster looks like of that insect to be able to get a positive ID to then know how I'm going to treat it. The number one thing that you need to know about pest control is that pests need a way in. 
if you can exclude them by doing what is known as an exclusion service, which is a pest remediation service, um, a pest prevention service, then you can solve about 80% of pest problems that are in a home, like large roaches, like even spiders, rodents. Because if you understand how they get in, I'm going to show you a series of pictures. And if we can say that 90% of our problems in commercial and residential accounts have to do with the lack of pest prevention, where we can get into pest proofing a property, we can eliminate 90, 95% of the pesticide needed to control the problem. I know this sounds counterintuitive. This is based on science. This is based on 50 to 70 years of entomology knowledge of how these pests behave. This is what you learn from the universities. This is what we have to do in a hospital. This is what we have to do in a sensitive laboratory, in a surgical center, because we cannot contaminate it. And yet you're buying all of these over-the-counter products and you're still having huge problems. And we solve all of these problems this way. I'm going to show you something. This is very easy. See, something as simple as this, a rodent problem. A rat can fit to that. A rat can climb up that wall on a textured wall and get into your dryer. Roaches can get into your dryer. By simply replacing that, you eliminate that possibility of that entry point for that pest. This is an actual picture. How many times do I get a call where somebody's got a rat died in the dryer and it smells and they had to call now a repairman and take that dryer apart? to get it repaired, to get it, to get that rat that died in there, all right? Inside the homes, between the walls, why? Because pests will get in from outside anywhere they can. Sometimes the roofs aren't properly sealed. The gaps, the angles underneath, I'm gonna show you several pictures where it isn't, and, the, and insects are getting in like American roaches. And then there are people saying, well, I only see them in the kitchens. Well, why? They're getting out through all the openings they could find. By sealing that, when we do our initial service, we seal this. And therefore, we don't have to use as much chemical, and we don't have to keep making a reapplication of chemical. What people think is that if I spray my house every month, okay, I'm not going to have bugs. Well, you're still going to have bugs. Remember, it kills. If the bug has to walk over the pesticide to die. The difference between pest control and killing is that you shouldn't be seeing the bugs every month and you shouldn't be needing a pest control service every month. This is an old way of doing things that is no longer necessary based on the knowledge that we have. Here is a crawl space. The biggest problems we have in South Florida uh, is with, with crawl spaces. And let me get a little bit closer here. Crawl spaces like this, we go in and customer tells us, oh no, our crawl space is sealed. So we go in, we do the initial service and we find a brick and there is a half inch to an inch of separation between that. These are actual clients. I've got thousands and thousands of pictures of jobs we've done where we show the client why it is that they're having a problem. People call us because they don't want the chemical. In order not to have to have the chemical, there has to be that pest proofing done. Simply bolting this back and screwing it back in and maybe drilling a couple of new holes solves the problem of them getting back into that crawl space, of a rat getting into the crawl space. Here is where the air conditioning conduit, the electrical, and the outlet for the water has been pushed through that mesh. They opened up the mesh, and now it was a nice attempt to exclude it. Unfortunately, my I can fit a whole thumb through there. Well, guess what? Rats are getting through there. We were kind of, we were getting constant calls from the client that they were getting 
American roaches all the time in the house. Well, there was a couple of other openings around the property and we sealed them and we stopped this from happening. Here is one where the mesh had completely fallen in. They had simply tacked a little bit of cloth there on that wood and it had fallen in. And you can get a cat in there. You can get a raccoon underneath it. These are crawl space homes. Here's one where it was completely encapsulated. They must have spent with the addition, by the way, this is a $1 million home on Miami Beach, about 1,700 square feet. They added about five, 600 square feet and they encapsulated the entire crawl space, which is, brings a humidity down and does the, the, the reduction in, in, in heat and it saves on the bill, but they left all kinds of holes. You encapsulated it, but roaches were still getting in. Mind you, this is the number one call that we get, a large roaches. A rat can fit through there. The contractor did the work, left the hole open. But here's another one where people call me and they say, well, how long have you been having this problem? Well, for about a year now. Well, chances are that hole has been there for eight, nine years. And a little bit at a time, roaches are getting in. Roaches are getting in, a rodent can get in. And now when you see roaches in your home in all different sizes, meaning it's birthed inside already, this didn't happen just a month ago. Now we have hundreds of roaches inside of the structure and you're seeing five, six, seven, ten a week. And we got to get those roaches out of that structure and bait it and kill them all because they're going to continue to come out and it's going to take months to get the control. You can't solve these problems with a one-time service. Here's a classic one, garage doors. There is the seal that's damaged and people are getting roaches in their garage. Well, if there's gaps in the seals and there's wood damage, there's obviously wood decay there, then easily we find snakes and large roaches and mice. And then worst of all, if, if, the, if the door from the garage into the home has a bad seal, you're going to see them. You say, we only see them in the laundry room. Well, the laundry room is right next to the garage. We only see it in the kitchen and the kitchen is right next to the garage. Kitchens and bathrooms are going to be the number one place and we're going to find out why. Here's a home that I did the initial service for, I did the initial inspection on, and they had just moved into this home. And I had looked at it, it's a steel roof, there was no gaps anywhere. All of a sudden I get a call. Well, there's a bad smell right over the garage. This is right next to the garage. That camera in the corner wasn't there. This recently installed. That's the garage right there. This is where they have their office and they had completely sealed it. And come to find out, I see this large conduit going up there and all this plastic. Well, the camera guys were there and then another electrical needed. And then they needed to install the box for um, the Tesla to get recharged and that's what that all that wiring is and if you can see that top corner right there on on the top of that big plastic piece there's a hole that was big enough they left it open they were doing their thing a rat climbed up went inside through there and died somewhere up there and they were smelling it well can't tear it open what did we do we went in and excluded it we went in and used a product called excluder and we stuffed it and now a rat's not going to be able to get anymore but the uncomfortable experience that they went through in dealing with this is what we try to save customers from is from the awkward experience you know that's our number one goal here's a classic one that i get calls and about 90 percent of all rodent problems that we have are attributed to this. This is the air conditioning conduit going up into the attic from the compressor that is outside. If you're in South Florida, this is common. What happened is they have brand new construction 
or they changed out the unit and they put this flashing covering that covers all the way up into the attic and they never sealed it with something that a rat couldn't go through. So here you are in a, in a townhome situation where you have five, six, seven, eight units. They're all exposed and I'm getting calls that they have rats going through the attic. We get to the unit. Sure enough, it's open. We can exclude this unit, but what happens with the other five units and the attics aren't sealed and rats are still going to go across. You get into an impossible situation where this now is an association problem where the association needs to inform all the tenants they need to get this sealed. Contractors install brand new air conditioners and never exclude it. Why? Because they're not rodent experts. There, we get all kinds of calls where people are getting American roaches. Why? American roaches like to go up into the attic. Any opening they find up, they're going to get in there. And they love attics. And then all of a sudden, you're in the second story and you're only getting roaches on the second floor? That makes no sense. Why? They're coming out through the attic. If you read the entomological information, you will find out that this is absolutely true. Here's one, same uh, home that had that micro, uh, that encapsulated that crawl space. They installed these little plastic vents over where the other vents used to be. And I said, you're still getting roaches in the home. Let me look around. Well, I look and those gaps are too big. The solution for this is remove that cover and install a mesh screen in the bag and reattach the cover. That's going to stop all insects from getting through there. Here is a, 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 a condo in Fort Lauderdale that is a, a, a hotel condo. It's a hotel, but it has individual units and it's time shared and all this. And they had installed in the bathroom, the owner of the unit had a little combination washer dryer, which was really small, installed and they opened up that wall to install. And he says, I'm getting all these roaches in the bathroom. They had about six pest control companies go there. We go in and we start probing around. We find in the, in the kitchen, this is what we found. This is what we had to do. We had to seal it. All of that was open. And they were, when I pulled that open, there was like 20 dead roaches in there. The problem was nobody knew that was in there because only the owner used it. He had a lock on it so that the tenants that were renting to use it didn't use it. Only he used it and nobody knew it was there. Nobody asked what is behind that. And we opened, I said, we need to open that to find out. He says, well, it's just a washer and dryer. Aha, a washer and dryer. There must be plumbing. There must be holes. They opened the wall to install it and never sealed it. This is the same unit in the kitchen. Having in the kitchen, this is an exhaust vent that went through the building out somewhere. And nobody had saw it behind, nobody had seen it behind the stove. We went and said, we're just going to buy a screen, custom cut it down, reassemble it, put it in there and caulk it. And we're going to stop. It's going to vent. So there's breathing that has to happen, but the bugs aren't going to get through. We, we also found there was drywall damage behind the refrigerator. We fixed that. Here she's had this unit. She's had six pest control companies go through there, spraying it every month and could not get the control. It had nothing to do with spraying. We got to stop the roaches from coming in. This is the same unit. You see those little black little things? Those are Velcro strips. This is a hot tub. This is the cover for the hot tub and all the plumbing is in there and there's holes about that big coming through the floor and there's dead roaches all over in there. Well, it was loose. All we did was take the little, you know, Velcro strips, replaced them all and got a nice tight seal. Now she only saw one roach in like three months that we had serviced that unit. Why? We stopped all the entry points. This is what I'm talking about. When 90% of the time we go in, it has nothing to do with chemical. When other pest control companies have failed is because they failed to exclude it. Most technicians aren't trained to do exclusion. They're trained to do chemical application. 
and they tell the customer, you need to fix this and you need to fix that. And the customer can't find the handyman, doesn't know how to do it, and it doesn't get done because the customer is busy. This is why we have to do it. If we want to get real control, we have to take a holistic pest control approach to the situation and handle it ourselves. Here is a home that there's nothing we can do for. If you notice, the drywall, there was water damage. The drywall completely fell apart. And I see back there the block, cinder block. This requires the kitchen to be removed, all the cabinets, re-drywall that entire wall, and then put it back. If there is no exclusion done on the outside where the roaches are getting in from, Every tile roof, every uh, Mexican tile or Spanish tile roof, and these houses have angles. Underneath those angles, the contractor doesn't seal very well because water is never going to get in. And roaches over time find their way in. We're not talking about a month. You're talking about year over year over year of exposure, allowing them and now allowing them to come in and breed inside the home is where the problem is. Here is one where they were having rat problems. This is an elderly daycare facility. And you can see there's a huge hole there because there is uh, uh, decay, wood decay, fungi on that wood. They're, the wood's rotted. And look at the gaps. And they were having an issue with rats getting in. In order for us to get the control in that place, we would have to go in at night when they close set up the traps, come back in the morning before they open, remove the traps. Why? These were elderly people that some of them had dementia. The last thing we want is for an elderly person to go in into a trap, get their hand caught, or touch one of our traps, start playing with it, set it off during the day. So it requires, so we're telling the owner, the easiest thing here is replace that door right now. That frame, get a contractor in here, replace that door. We were going in and we had caught two rats and we had put stations outside with, you know, rodenticide bait. But that isn't a guarantee that the rat's going to go inside of a bait station when he's used to getting inside and eating. He was finding peanuts. He was finding food. They had food left out. They had fruit. And this was a nightmare to try to control. We got a call from a mall store that is this is the jewelry store by the way um this is the lobby to the jewelry store by the way the cheapest item in there is probably thirteen thousand dollars it's in an open mall meaning they have gardens inside the mall within 20 feet from there there's water fountains and there is a uh landscape there's mulch there's dirt and they were getting roaches inside the store. They were coming in in the morning, finding dead roaches, finding live roaches inside the store. All I did is take one look at that, looked across 20 feet from there and said, yeah, they're all breeding inside all those plants and they're coming in at night. Well, you can spray that all you want to get control. And what happens to all the mulch areas nobody's treating, to all those flower beds? And they were getting roaches. I said, you need to call a door manufacturer that makes this door. Have them send a technician over to put seals between those doors. And that's going to solve your problem. Because the mall already had a pest control company coming in monthly or bi-monthly or whatever and spraying. The problem is, from the time that it takes for that bug to walk across that spray and die, it's 7 to 10 days. The bug has to walk. If they're not spraying all those plants in the area where the mulch is, they're breeding in there and moving across the entire mall. Apartment building calls us. These are half a million to a million dollar condos. And they said customers are finding roaches on the first floor and all over the stairs. We need something stronger to apply. I took one picture of that and said, look at the gap on the bottom of that door. This is right on the street where there is sewers, 
there are storm drains and there's mulch areas and gardens and the bugs are just walking in off the street. All the maintenance engineer had to do was put a new threshold on that, fix it and put an outside seal so the bugs can't get through that door. That was the, that was the solution. It isn't about stronger. There's no such thing as stronger chemical. It doesn't exist. We can only apply it legally at the dosage that the label says, and we cannot go above that. And no matter how much chemical you put outside that door, the rain is going to wash it away. You can't spray hard surfaces with most pyrethroids. It's illegal because it'll wash off and go into the storm drain. The solution is exclusion. Here is a rehab center that this is the kitchen and they would leave the door open literally all day. They had rats and roaches walking into there, literally walking in. This was not the only door. This is the back door. Three feet from that door on this side is a catch basin for the grease where there's a grease trap and there's a sewer right there. And they were just coming up through the sewer and walking right in. There is that frame needed to get replaced. That door needed to get replaced and be closed at all times. Here's a warehouse that had huge rat problems. We got called. And I said, how often is this door open? He says, well, all day. And then look at the damage around that frame from the, from the forklifts hitting it. This is a retail flooring place which had a, a, a retail showroom and the rat problems were so big and they were paying $65 a month for like a 10,000 square foot warehouse ridiculous I said you know you're gonna need several thousand for us to come in start dealing with it. you got to get this repaired you got to get the doors shut they got to be shut during the day says we can't we got shipments coming in and out of here constantly with trucks backing up and says you're you're in a commercial mall in a strip the, the rats are going to be all over the place. They're always getting in, and there's a million holes in this place. For $65 a month, there's nobody that's going to spend more than five minutes in here trying to help you with this problem. You need to spend two to $300 a month minimum plus a couple thousand dollars to get this trapped, install stations outside, and start getting the rodent population down. They weren't willing to do that. Here is a dealership. This is a Mercedes dealership. These doors are automated. When the vehicle drives up, it opens and it immediately closes behind the technician or the customer. Look at the gap underneath that door. They had rat problems and rats had gotten into toolboxes, cars, caused several thousands of dollars worth of damage. The, we had done the metal work on the side frames because there was these square gaps that the manufacturer had left so that you can run wires from the alarm system underneath. And nobody had sealed it after the alarm system was installed and it had a sensors on it. So we had to do metal work to stop the rats from coming into the side on all these doors. There's like 20 doors in this dealership. But then they needed, look at the, the gap. There's, the floor wasn't level. So they needed to call in the door manufacturer and make sure that door closed all the way to the bottom and had a seal. We had 30 stations. Uh, we had a total of about 68 stations installed outside to control the rodent population. One every 30 feet around this massive, massive structure. Here's an exterior door to a restaurant. Rats were just walking right in. Roaches all the time. All we have to do is install a seal outside those doors and the problem is solved. Here is a repair job that was done that wasn't done right. And it failed. And you can see the disrepair that this house was in, but they had rodent problems climbing up there and getting inside. If this was repaired properly, we could control the problem, but when the repairs aren't done, we can't help the client. Here's another one in another restaurant facility complaining about roaches. And, and the thing is that the dumpster was less than 10 feet from there. 
So they were going to the dumpster. There's always flies, rodents, roach issues near dumpsters, especially in food service facilities. That just needed a threshold fix. This is why in commercial, we include all this when we do an initial service and why you'll pay six, seven, eight hundred, nine hundred dollars on an initial service because we got to install fly lamps to control flies in a restaurant. We got to install rodent stations. We got to do the sealing of all these doors. We got to do the general pest control. We got to clean out the drains every single month so they don't build up. It's an, an, an enormous cost to really do it right. And when somebody says we're paying $45 a month, I said, no wonder you have all these issues. There's nobody that can spend any time here. And time is money. Customer call says they got mosquitoes. Screen. Right there. Look at the gap. The door, the window's open. And the gap on that screen. That's no screen at all. Fixing that screen is the problem. Rats getting up, roaches getting up, climbing up the pipes. Here's another one. Look how look at the, that black mark that you see. Those are known as rub marks from rodents. Rodents have been getting into this place for years. We looked into the attic and there was rodent poop everywhere in that attic. We had to do metal work there to fix that. That's actually the line, the, the wire you see is the wire coming off of the pole. They were climbing across the wire, walking across, and just whoop, walking right up into the attic. And that was about $1,200 worth of repair work that we had to do to custom cut all that aluminum because we could not remove that pipe. We had to custom cut sheet metal work uh, to fix all that, and plus a bunch of openings around the entire structure. You can see the wood had been replaced and never painted. So when things are in disrepair, Chemical, what, what was their solution? Throw rodenticide in the attic. Every pest control guy would come and just throw rodenticide in the attic and rats would die. Except they would keep coming in. If we just solve that once and for all, and we're talking about six, seven, eight, she told me it was like 10 years they've been dealing with the rat problem. And nobody ever said, let's seal that. Let's repair that. All right, so things you need to know. Well, bugs, rodents, Everyone needs to eat and drink. And let's say rodent stations improperly placed to begin with are never going to help you if there's openings in a building. You got to get the rat to go into that box. And how do you get a rat to go into that box? That's very hard. You got to put bait in there. And if there's competing food, if you got a home that the owners or the next door people are leaving dog food out and they're feeding on dog food, well, they're never going to go inside that box to eat an artificial bait that you put in there. So this isn't a magic bullet. People say, I want rodent stations around the property. Rodent stations help. But if there's openings or if there's competition for food, it's not going to happen. You throw in a badly maintained station. We actually got called. We, we were doing the lawn and gardens for them and they asked us, to look at their rodent station and finding out why there's dead squirrels everywhere. We go in and we find the rodenticide is being just thrown in there. The technician was not cleaning out the box. They just got old moldy bait in there. Rodents are not going to eat that. Second of all, if it gets taken out and a dog finds it or eats it, then what? This is why we got so many laws and so many problems with people not understanding that you can't do stuff like this. Well, no amount of rodenticide boxes is going to help you if this is your common condition. This is more common than you think in, in associations. The reason that this place was like this is because there was only two pickups a week. It was more garbage being put out than you can actually haul away in a week. The solution was to add two more days. The owner of the property did not want to spend the money. They had rodents, raccoons in there. We would go in and we've actually cleaned it out several times and put it all in there. By the time we picked it all up, that dumpster was full again and they just had picked it up. Again, no amount of rodent station. There's a milk box right there. There's all that food. Why would a rat? And then you're wondering why you have rat problems in the property. 
no amount of rodenticide. You can't throw it out. I see people throwing rodenticide out in the yards and in the locals, just throwing it out to, for the rats to eat it. That's illegal. And this is where we run into problems where people get fined and where they, they stop allowing people to use certain products because of the misuse. You're in the home and there's a bag of dog food right there. And they got a rodent problem. I just had a call from a client who said, I've got a rat that got in the house and we can't catch it. We've been trying to catch it for weeks. You can't catch it. And then he says, well, I've got two dogs and a cat. And I said, okay, let me, let me ask you this. Are you leaving food out for the dog to feed at night? Because you're leaving water and food out all day long for this dog. Yes. And I said, well, that's why you're not catching the rat. The rodent knows he can go every single day to that one spot and eat with no problems. What do I do? I said, very simply, you take the food away from the dog and you only feed the dog when the dog is mealtime. You don't leave it. Are you leaving it overnight? Yes. You're leaving the water overnight. Yes. Well, he's got food and water. You're never going to catch him. So I told him to do this. He says, well, I got to talk to my wife and see how she feels about that. And I said, well, until you do that, I understand you're not going to catch this rat. He's not going to go and eat the food that he's already used to eating. Eat something else on that trap. You take away the food and you put the same dog food in the trap and watch how you catch him very quickly. Let me see what I'm going to do. I got to convince my wife. And this is common, people leaving food out for the dog, thinking the dog needs to eat all night. The dog can eat two meals a day. You feel guilty that you leave the dog alone all day long and the dog can't feed himself. You can feed him in the morning. You can feed him in the afternoon when you get there. And you take the food away and you don't put him on an all-night buffet. And you solve the roach problem. It, this is also happens when we have German roach issues, when we have American roach issues. We can't seem to get the control and we're asking the client, are you leaving food out for the dog? And they're telling us no. And then we come in and find the bowl full of food one evening when they called us out. People do things on emotions that make no sense. But if you're a landlord, if you're a building engineer, a, a, a maintenance engineer. You got to understand that you got to know to look for these problems because that's how we end up with these issues that we later can't control. Understand that, well, I keep my house super clean. Well, the, here's underneath a dishwasher. That dishwasher has been there probably 18 to 20 years. All kinds of food and drink have fallen under there. You can see it. There's crud everywhere. Guess what? It can be clean. You cleaned all around. I couldn't find any dirt anywhere. But underneath there, if a roach makes it in, he's going to have all the food he needs. If ants make it in, people say, I've got sugar ants. I said, no, you don't have sugar ants. Because most of the ants that invade homes are omnivorous. They eat proteins. They eat carbohydrates. They eat oils. And they eat sugars. And if you have grains of rice and if you have anything that fell under there, when we're trying to control a problem, it's not impossible. It makes it more difficult. The longer time I have to be there, the more trips I have to make, the more I have to charge you. And understand that there's going to be food. Here is an example of a grease and oil uh, in the bottom of a stove top. That's enough to feed roaches. They'll feed on anything. So if we're getting control and we're using baits, which we're using, which are more effective, understand that it's competing with the existing food. There is a dumpster. And there you see the rodent station way in the back. And there is all kinds of food on the floor. Chances are that station can't be maintained when the technician comes in. He has to move that dumpster. 
You got all this food on the floor. There's crud everywhere. Let's look at this one. That needs to be pressure washed. Listen, dumpster rooms need to be pressure washed at least once a month. The there is um, the um, garbage chutes need to be treated every month for flies and crud that gets stuck of all the food and all the liquids on the way down to remove fly problems. If this hasn't been cleaned probably in years, hasn't been pressure washed. So hygiene is important to remove the food particles that they're going to have access to. And if you start washing this, you find out you have less rodents, less roaches, less flies. Chemical is not the solution to this. You will never control any of these problems with chemical alone. It is impossible. You leave the dishes overnight. And now, roaches and everything have all this natural food to eat. And we're trying to do a roach service. And you have to clean everything every day. Leave it spotless. Don't give them food to eat that competes with baits. Because most people don't understand that baits are food-grade pesticides. They have foods in them to attract the roaches, to attract the ants, to attract the rodent. And if the rodent can find this in the, in the kitchen, he's going to prefer that any day. Here's a rooftop, second story, in a building. They're complaining they got mosquitoes inside and roaches coming into that second floor. Well, I'm looking out this window and I see this puddle of water and there's all that organic matter growing green. Well, they need to talk to a roofer and get this straightened out because there was no screen on those louvers to help the air come in and out of that building and all the mosquitoes and flies were coming in through there. Had nothing to do with pet. What am I going to do? Spray the entire rooftop every single week? These are problems that we can't control. They got mosquitoes all over the place and going, where are the mosquitoes coming from? They're breeding up there. I don't know why I got roaches in my bathroom. If you look at this, if you understand American cockroaches, American cockroaches will eat absolutely anything. What is there to eat in that toilet? Well, there's fecal matter, and they love fecal matter. This is why they're in sewers. Underneath that rim, even if you clean it, they're going to find that little bit of fecal matter that's left, and they're going to eat it. They got food, and they have water. So being clean and being pest control clean are two different things. If we can exclude the pest, if the pest makes it in, the point is this. They're going to find food and water no matter where they are, because they're adapted to finding the smallest amount of food and water. So even if you're meticulously clean and a roach makes it in there, they will have enough food. And if you get a pair and they can breed, you're going to get breeding issues. And this is why a pesticide by itself will never solve the problem. Exclusion has to be in place. Pest prevention has to be in place. Water outside. Full of larvae right next to a door. Mosquitoes are breeding in there. Plus, rats are going to come in there and drink. All the insects in the area will have all the water they need. Getting rid of that water would get rid of the mosquito problem that they were experiencing near the front door. Every time they opened the door, mosquitoes would get in. They're breeding in that pot. All right, so a place to hide. Mosquitoes, uh, rodents, roaches, need places to hide they're experts at it this is what is known as a crack a void in the wall a crack insects that invade homes are predominantly what are known as thigmotactic insects they love to feel their body touching something and going into cracks and crevices this is why a crack and crevice treatment is more effective than a baseboard spray it just takes more time and more work. But if you caulk that and you seal it, the insect can't get behind there. If not, every single month, you got to come in with your crack and crevice device and go through those cracks and crevices, treating them again. 
Because if a pest makes it in, that's where they're going to want to go. Here's underneath the kitchen. They just remodeled this kitchen. Spend about $30,000 remodeling the kitchen. The contractor left holes behind the wall. Left all those cracks. And they're saying, I'm finding roaches in the kitchen. I'm finding roaches. We don't know where they're coming from. Well, they're coming from behind the wall. It's not sealed. The solution there is going under there with a foam sealant and an extension and reaching all the way back there and sealing all that so that the roaches don't find their way in. Because remember, they're finding their way in from outside that structure somewhere. And they're going into dark places, humid places, warm places to hide. If you remove the condition, putting all that bait back there was never, ever, ever going to solve all that problem. Look at that uh, piece of dry wood that's cut out, that's missing. Roaches are coming in. We found live and dead American roaches under there. German roaches, biggest mistake pest control people make is they don't go all the way to the back of that cabinet. They don't stick their body in there. Some of them get lazy. You see, they only come in and they spray the baseboards and then they'll put a little bit of gel bait here and there. Never, ever, ever going back to where the roaches are. If you get all that gel bait and you buy a tube of gel bait online and you buy it at domyown.com and you only apply it to the open areas that you're seeing them outside, but you're not getting behind where they're hiding, you're going to fail every time. It doesn't matter how good anyone claims the product is. Without the right application of that product, it's never going to happen. Where do they like to be? In warm places, dark places. Look, they've been trying to control that roach problem. There are the roach discs, the little roach motels, the, the Max Force uh, bait stations, and yet full of roaches. We had to pull that. Look at all the cracks around that tile, places where they can hide. They got the motor of the refrigerator, the compressor back there, which is warm. It has condensation. There's water. They can live back there and hide. And this is why everybody fails. They don't move that refrigerator. They just simply spray around it. Well, that's not going to work. Look at how many dead roaches there are back there after we've treated all right, so now we're going to get into identification. And this is the most difficult part for any non-professional, including professionals, that either never come across that pest, have never taken an entomology course, haven't identified pests, or simply have never looked at the uh, Truman's Guide or uh, the malice guide, or any of the entomological information available from their state, they've been taught to spray. And they've never taught to identify. And then when I get a call from a client, 99 out of 100 times, they say, I know what I've got. I Googled it. And 99.9% .9 of the time I'll go there, and they're completely wrong because they do not understand how to do pest identification because it is very difficult. Most of the time when I do pest identification on something I've never seen before, it can take me two, three, four hours of sitting there under a microscope, looking at an insect, tearing it apart limb by limb and looking at the antenna and counting how many nodes are in that antenna. The design of those nodes, is it a club? You know, doesn't it not have a club? I look at the, the head. I look at the mandibles. I look at the hairs on the body. I look at the gaster. I look at the thorax. I look at the uh, petioles between the gaster and the thorax. And I compare this and I take notes of all this. And then I'm going online on the entomological data and seeing what do, do I identify this with based on the entomological data that I have from identification. Somebody sends me a picture like this. And can you tell me what this is? I found it in my house. Well, it's a bad picture. I can tell you that. Other than that, I can't tell you what that is. It's dark. It's not close enough. It's not clear. If you're going to take a picture to send to a pest control professional, 
or to a laboratory or to the entomology center or to the extension service. You need a very clear and good picture. This is the microscope I use most of the time for identification. It's a Celestron microscope. It's a USB. It hooks up to my computer. I can pretty much enlarge any insect, take a look at it, dissect it visually, and ID it. Most of the insects like this that I got from the field, those are forehead flies. And customers said they had fruit flies. Whenever a customer tells me they have fruit flies, I got to scratch my head and going, do you have any fruit? Well, no, then probably you don't have fruit flies. You've got forehead flies. These are known as humpback flies. And a tool like this that you can attach. Now you got to order one and you got to have one, but they're extremely helpful. Installing it to your smartphone, clipping it on and taking a close up macro picture. This is a macro lens. This was given to me at uh, Pest Management University um, when I took my master's course. You know, they were giving those out for free. Um, you know, you can order them online, at, um, you know, Amazon or anywhere, and you can use it even if you're a, a professional. Hook it up to your camera. You can take a lot of cool, neat pictures when you're in the field. Uh, does very well for macro photography uh, for the phone. A baggie. Just a simple baggie. Professionals, carry these baggies with you. Owners, just, you know, put a couple of these and hand them to a pest control professional. Have them take it back to their entomologist or their certified operator. Have them identify it, what it is. You got to make sure sometimes you have the whole insect. A lot of the time what people will say is, well, where is the insect? I need a picture of it. Well, here's the picture. And it's a bad picture. What did you do with the insect? Well, I cleaned it up and threw it out. It doesn't help if you throw it out. Collect it, put it in a baggie. And then that way when I go over or I send a technician over, he can bring that back to me and I can identify it under a microscope. A lot of the time from a picture, we cannot do it. Let me show you how hard this is. These are termites that we collected this week on site. And this is a little vial that I carry with alcohol, rubbing alcohol. And the best thing to do is this better than a baggie because it won't get dehydrated or get preserved. Okay. When you put it in a baggie and it gets dehydrated and spends all day in the truck, it could dehydrate and it could shrivel. And it sometimes it's very difficult to tell what the insect is um, because it shriveled up. So it loses a lot of its, its characteristics. Here is again, that bad picture that was sent to me and I can't identify what that is. Here is on a monitor. This is why we use monitors in the home. We had put this board out and we couldn't figure out what the lady was calling about that she was seeing flying around. So we went out and we put monitors. And I told the, the, the tech, when you're there, see if you can, you know, in the air swipe, if you see a couple of them and try to glue them onto the board and bring the board back. Well, it turns out that those aren't flies. Those are crazy ant swarmers because she was complaining that they were only in her bedroom. Her bedroom, they were getting in through the window because she had bushes outside and they were swarming, you know, they were on the bushes and they were coming in. They weren't in the bathroom. This would have been a filth fly. We would have had people complain about it in the bathroom or the kitchen where there's water because they deposit, filth flies will deposit their eggs and they want to be near water. Well, these guys were in the bedroom. So I said, it can't be a fly. It's got to be something else. Sure enough, tech brought it in. We were able to ID it and then say, okay, you're going to have to wait till the swarm dies out. We're going to install these lamps and these lamps will help catch them at night because they're attracted to the UV light and bring down that population for you. No amount of chemical was ever going to prevent or solve this problem. Here, what we see is what is known as a carpenter ant. The one on the right, there's two on the right or on the left, and there's two there. And those are two different types of carpenter ant swarmers. The one on the left, that is a uh, tortuganus carpenter ant, both in Florida. And the one on the right is a carpenter ant alate. People think they got termites and they're calling us, we got termites, they're swarming. Well, it's not termite swarming season. Let's go look at it and see what you got. 
You got carpenter ants. Chances are you got a carpenter ant nest in the house or there's a satellite nest in the house. The one on the right is a bull ant. It is a carpenter ant. It is the Florida carpenter ant, not the alate. Looks completely different than the alate. That thing looks built. It looks buff. And trying to identify, a lot of the times, the, the carpenter ant is going to get mis, um, depending on the species, is going to get misidentified. Here's a glue board with four red flies on it. That is an actual forward fly. The customer was saying they got fruit flies. Usually if there's no fruit, there's no fruit flies. You bring it in when you buy fruit, you get rid of the fruit. Usually the fruit fly will die on its own. But when they're persistent, we caught these on a lamp that we put in the kitchen and they were forward flies. These are known as humpback flies. How do we know? We look under a microscope and that humpback is there. That's a humpback fly. Here is another insect that the customer thought and the technician thought they had a flying ant. Well, it turns out that is a parasitic wasp, which was very rare. The reason that one was there is because that property, that apartment, was about less than a mile from the world-famous Hialeah racetrack where they have horses. And they release these flies, and these flies are natural around dung because they will control the house flies and the house fly larvae on the dung. And this is why they had them in their house. Trying to identify this little insect, look at the size of that. That is a dime, and that is the date on a dime. Go look at a date on a dime and see how small that is to try to identify. It was confused as an ant. Thought it was some type of um, little crazy ant or something because you saw how that crazy ant can look alike. So identification is really a lot tougher than most people think. Here is Australian cockroach nymphs. That's an Australian cockroach, probably in its last instar on the left. And those are all the nymphs that we found in the house when we did the service. The house was closed for about three months. They went on vacation and they found a slew of cockroaches. How did they get in? Through the sewer system. All the traps dried out and the roaches are in the sewer system, moved in. The one on the right is a German cockroach with instars, nymphs, in different instars, different growth stages. You can see how difficult that is for an untrained eye to know the difference between that little one on the right, on the right picture, and the little one on the left picture. They look identical. People say, well, I got little roaches. Well, I got them in all sizes. When somebody tells me they got them in all sizes, guess what? They usually have either American cockroach, they'll have, depending on a smoky brown cockroach, or they'll have an Australian cockroach. How do you know it's Australian and not American? Because the yellow, and they look like these bat eyes in the back of that, the thorax or the prothorax, which is like the back of the head. The head is actually underneath there on the tip. That's not the head, though. That's the thorax. It's a different part of the body. So we got plenty of resources for you to learn about how to actually control these problems. If you go to naturepest.com, I've got a DIY podcast. We've got about 20 episodes on that coming out, and we got more episodes on the way. And we also have a DIY blog that shows you how to actually solve specific problems here we can't get why didn't you recommend any chemicals because i carry 30 something chemicals on the truck products to handle each individual problem i mean one problem alone could use up three different chemicals four chemicals for instance dealing with drain flies you got to use dsv nibor d and foam and then outside if you've got them you got to spray it with an igr and maybe a natural essential oil to control it outside and then come back the following week and repeat it all over again for two to three weeks. So getting into specific pest control problems is going to be very difficult unless we create a blog. We also have the uh, Pest Geek podcast, which this is an industry podcast for growing and operating a pest control business. This is not for the residents, although I have many, many technical and tactical podcasts, which we get into depth real depth 
on solving difficult problems and solving routine issues that people miss on how to solve it. So if you got the patience and you want to dig through there and you want to get a real, if you're a building manager that says, man, I really got to know this stuff because I'm dealing with so many issues here and the pest control company isn't solving it and I need to know why. This is how you know why. Do you become a professional? There's also a nature pest on YouTube. I have a YouTube channel. That YouTube channel has hundreds of videos on actual how to solve most German roach problems, American roach problems, drain fly problems, ant problems. Very, 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 very specific stuff in there. And there's the Pest Geek podcast on YouTube that also has many videos. But again, this is more focused on business development, business growth, and operating a pest control business. So if you're a professional, um, I've got a couple hundred videos in there too. And finally, we're coming up with the Pest Geek Academy where we have certified for continuing education credit courses that we're going to be offering and it's getting populated uh, we've got about four or five courses that we want to put in there. And these courses are going to be anywhere between one entire, like the CEU courses are two hours each. So one hour and one hour on something different, you get two CEU hours. The other courses are uh, a new technician training course that has everything a technician needs to know about law, about IPM, about HCS, uh, labels, um, SDSs. And all of these legal things that a technician needs to know before he starts to work. And then we're going to have actual training courses on how to deal with roach problems and ant problems and all kinds of different um, situations. These are real world training situations that we're trying to get into uh, with a lot of this. So there you go. Those are all the resources. And we hope that this has been helpful to you to help you understand how to start tackling and whether you have a competent pest control technician or a pest control company. Uh, if you have and you're looking for a holistic company, we're only in Miami-Dade, Broward, uh, and we're going to be Miami-Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach soon. Um, so mostly South Florida. We're planning to go into Naples and the Keys, but we're only dealing with South Florida. If you need a technician, uh, a, a good IPM company, that does holistic pest management, that does eco-friendly pest control. Hey, feel free to drop us a message on Messenger. It's the best way through, through Facebook, either on Pest Geek Podcast or on Nature Pest because I get those messages no matter what system I'm on. I'm on five different phones sometimes. I'm on the computer. I'm on the road. Um, I can always get a message there. Um, you can, you know, trying to call us is going to be very difficult because we get so many calls and trying to call everybody back that needs help. But Messenger is the best way uh, if you're needing. Also, if you go on my, you follow me, Franklin Hernandez. Uh, look up Franklin Hernandez Pest Control. Hey, I got hundreds of professionals, follow, thousands. I mean, we got about 3,000 professionals that follow me on there. You, you feel free to drop a question in there and say, hey, I got this problem. I got this insect. Can somebody help me with this? We'd be more than glad to put all of our network at your disposal to help you and help pest control companies that maybe you can't solve the problem. Maybe you need a professional. We can get you a competent person uh, on there that can help you. Hey, I hope this beneficial has been helpful. This is Frank the Pest Geek wishing you a pestacular day.